Suppose you want to get and study personal data of people outside the US. Or you may not be planning to do so, but it's possible that data within a corpus you are working with contains personal data of people from outside the US. What privacy laws besides US law might apply to those data and what you do with them? While we can't consider all possible privacy laws around the world, let's take a look at one of the best known that may affect US researchers' access to data and that is also inspiring some changes to U.S. privacy law, the European General Data Protection Regulation, or GDPR. The GDPR took effect on May 25, 2018, and replaced an earlier European privacy law known as the Data Protection Directive. The GDPR is the model in many ways for California's Consumer Privacy Act and some other state privacy laws being proposed in the U.S. The GDPR is designed to strengthen privacy protections for residents of EU single market countries, basically the EU member states, plus Norway, Iceland, Liechtenstein, and Switzerland, and make them more consistent across these countries. Having said that, like US privacy law, the GDPR strikes a balance between privacy interests and other legitimate interests involving personal data, including research, like U.S. privacy laws, it does not apply to the data of deceased persons. And, as in U.S. privacy law, anonymized and de-identified data are not subject to the GDPR. The GDPR does not provide specific methods for identifying, sorry, de-identifying personal data the way that HIPAA does in the U.S. EU authorities set a somewhat higher standard and consider data to be de-identified only if there is no reasonable means through which someone who has access to the data could use the data to re-identify the data subject. The GDPR sets out basic principles for processing personal data, grants a number of rights to individuals regarding their personal data, and imposes several requirements on controllers and processors of personal data. A controller is an individual or organization that determines the purposes and means of processing the personal data. Basically, someone who decides what personal data are needed for a project or activity and what will be done with them. A processor is an individual or organization that carries out the processing for the controller. Personal data is defined very broadly as any information relating to an identified or identifiable natural person. Processing is also defined very broadly and means any operation or set of operations which is performed on personal data or on sets of personal data. The GDPR obviously applies to controllers and processors in the EU, but unlike most laws, it is also extraterritorial. That is, it applies to organizations and individuals outside of the EU as well under certain conditions. Specifically, Article 3 of the GDPR uh, says that organizations and individuals located outside of the EU, including in the US, can be controllers or processors who are subject to the GDPR if they direct or conduct the processing of personal data of EU residents who are actually in the EU, and one of the three following conditions applies. They do it in connection with activities of an establishment they have in the EU, for example, an office in an EU member country, or the processing relates to the offering of goods or services to the data subjects, including for free, or the processing involves monitoring data subjects' behavior that takes place in the EU. This means that many TDM data sources and collaborators inside and outside the EU will be subject to the GDPR. But it seems highly unlikely that the GDPR would apply directly to humanities researchers performing TDM in the US. I'm assuming here that the first condition does not apply. With respect to the second, while actively recruiting EU residents for a research study would be considered offering services to them, active subject recruitment is rare in humanities research. Note that simply having an organizational website with contact information that's accessible to people in the EU is not enough to show an intent to offer services to EU residents. What about monitoring behavior? The regulation discusses internet tracking and applying data processing techniques to internet data as one means of monitoring behavior. But this is focused on profiling particular persons to make decisions about them specifically, or to analyze or predict their preferences. 
For example, profiling for marketing purposes. So while TDM researchers may use large amounts of social media and other internet data, including data of EU residents, and apply algorithms to draw insights across large corpora and make generalizable conclusions, that activity is not likely to come within the definition of monitoring behavior. How might the GDPR affect TDM research in the US then? In the same way that US privacy laws tend to do, by regulating the activity of data sources and collaborators in ways that may complicate or limit data available to TDM researchers. And to the extent it inspires copycat laws in the US, researchers may face some direct application of GDPR-like principles in future. Perhaps of special interest to humanities TDM, the GDPR prohibits the processing of several categories of sensitive data, including racial or ethnic origin, political opinions, religious or philosophical beliefs, and sex life or sexual orientation, unless an exception applies. One exception is explicit consent. Another is where the data are manifestly made public by the data subject. Scientific or historical research, archiving and statistical analyses using these sensitive data may be authorized by separate EU or member state laws. Overall, the GDPR builds in several protections for research, archiving, and statistical analyses with personal data. As with U.S. privacy law, much will depend on how stakeholders and authorities interpret and enforce its provisions, including separate member state laws affecting research activities. Let's take a look at the GDPR's core requirements and how they relate to research and archiving. The GDPR requires a lawful basis for processing personal data and that processing be done in a fair and transparent way. Consent that is, quote, freely given, specific, informed, and unambiguous, close quote, is one lawful basis for processing personal data. Notably, the GDPR, like the recent changes to the common rule for human subjects research in the U.S., contemplates that researchers who get data through informed consent may rely on a consent that describes a broader field of research and captures future studies that haven't yet been formulated to avoid problems of having to go back, try to find, and reconsent subjects down the road. Additionally, personal data may be processed lawfully without consent altogether. If processing is necessary for controllers' legitimate interests, unless those interests are overridden by fundamental rights of a data subject, especially a child, that requires protection of their personal data. Commentators have suggested that research may itself be a legitimate interest that directly authorizes processing without consent. The GDPR requires that data collection be limited to specified and legitimate purposes and compatible secondary uses of the data. Importantly, sharing data for archiving in the public interest, scientific or historical research, or statistical purposes is a compatible use as long as the research includes appropriate safeguards, like pseudonymization, to minimize the use of identifiable data as much as possible. So even if research were not a lawful basis for processing by itself, it is enabled as a compatible use. And individual member states may pass laws that limit people's ability to exercise some important GDPR rights in connection with research and archiving activities. Rights like the right to confirm what data a controller has about them or to ask for correction of those data. Laws that limit the ability to assert these rights in connection with research or archiving are designed to prevent undue influence with research and archival records. Next, the GDPR requires that data collection be minimized to just what is needed, that data are kept accurate and up to date and that identifiers are kept for no longer than necessary. Again, however, personal data may be kept longer as needed for archiving in the public interest, scientific or historical research, or statistical purposes with appropriate safeguards for those data. And the GDPR requires that processing be done in an appropriately secure manner. The GDPR gives data subjects rights to have at the time of data collection transparent and clear notice of who is collecting their data and why, 
where the data came from, how long it will be stored, who it will be shared with, including whether the controller intends to send it to another country, and various other information. Here too, though, we see some preferential treatment for research and archiving. Notably, when a data controller, say a researcher in the EU, gets personal data, but not from the data subjects directly, Article 14 says that they do not need to provide the usual notice if providing it would prove impossible or involve a disproportionate effort in connection with archiving data in the public interest or performing research or statistical analyses. Now, I will say that impossible really does mean impossible. Uh, there has to be true impossibility. Uh, it's not really clear what disproportionate effort uh, means in practice because impossibility seems to be carrying the day. The GDPR gives data subjects various rights to access their data, to ask for correction of errors, and to object to and restrict the processing of their data in certain circumstances. It also lets subjects object to processing their data in connection with research or statistical purposes, but the controller may determine that continued processing is necessary to its legitimate interests or the public interest. Finally, and somewhat famously, Article 17 of the GDPR gives data subjects a right to erasure, more commonly referred to as a right to be forgotten. Data subjects can demand that a controller erase their personal data, quote, without undue delay, which the EU interprets to mean about a month. If the controller has made the data public, it must take reasonable steps to follow up with other controllers processing the data to have copies and links erased. This is a broader right than the original right to be forgotten under the Data Protection Directive, which was only about delisting data so that it wouldn't show up as results in a name-based internet search. The original data did not need to be deleted at the source as they do now under the GDPR. This is important because Google, which was a party to the 2014 case establishing the first right to be forgotten under European law, argued that delisting only had to occur with respect to searches originating in the EU, not worldwide. And the European Court of Justice agreed with Google in 2019. Deletion of data at source would have a global impact although it seems unrealistic that a request for erasure will in fact result in all copies of publicly available data being deleted. Although the right to request erasure exists, consistent with other GDPR provisions favorable to research and with concerns about protecting the historical record, Article 17 allows controllers to reject the request for erasure when continued processing of the data is needed for archiving in the public interest, research or statistical purposes, and requests uh, to erase would render impossible or seriously impair the purposes of that processing. Google's transparency report, part of which is seen here, indicates that since May 2014, it has delisted about 46.4% of the URLs requested and that it commonly refuses to delist information based on factors such as whether the content relates to past crime, political office or public position or professional position, or its self-authored content or journalistic in nature. May colleagues within the EU share research corpora with US researchers, basically treating them as processors, if the corpora contain EU residents' personal data? Assuming that the sharing is otherwise lawful based on everything we just discussed, yes, particularly if subjects have expressly consented to transfers. In the absence of consent, it's a little more work. The EU has concluded that US law does not adequately safeguard personal data, largely based on the government's broad counterterrorism surveillance activities. So to allow export of EU personal data to America, the EU requires some other means to demonstrate adequate safeguards for the data. The most common way for nonprofit universities would be a re written agreement containing certain standard contractual clauses that the EU has pre-approved to adequately protect personal data and the ability of data subjects to enforce their rights. Those clauses include liability to the data subjects under certain conditions, 
audits and agreement to European law, and so would need to be approved by university council. In the longer run, it may be possible for universities as a sector to develop a code of conduct for approval by the European Commission to facilitate data transfers for research. The GDPR is considered the strictest data privacy law in existence, at least on paper. Enforcement is another story. National Data Protection Authorities, or DPAs, have imposed some large fines, over $100 million for data breaches at British Airways and Marriott, for example, and a $57 million fine on Google. But DPAs are generally underfunded and understaffed, particularly compared to major multinationals who use a lot of data and have resources to litigate. And that may make robust enforcement very difficult. So perhaps even the strictest privacy law on the books may offer less protection than anticipated. This further suggests that law does not provide all the answers, which is why, again, ethics and institutional norms must play as great or greater a role as law in answering tough questions about handling personal data in research.